Well, welcome to The Journey. Um, my name is Kevin Polkey, and I am the host of The Journey. And today I have a, a special guest with us. Uh, Sarah Grayson uh, has, is someone that uh, I actually met as she was getting ready to do a, a, a local book signing and wanted to reach out to hear a little bit about uh, Sarah and and have uh, have everyone get to, know, uh, get to know you, Sarah. And so thank you for being with us uh, uh, today. So, um, so whenever, you know, I have somebody come on, um, I want to just uh, have people get to know you as a just as a person and get to know you a little bit. So, sir, what do you when you have the opportunity to have fun? What do, what do you do to have fun, sir? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me also. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, when I have fun, I uh, I like to really express my creativity. So anything that is involving writing or drawing or painting or even anything in nature. My son and I just made some some beads out of willow willow tree leaves. So oh. anything that is creative and artsy is what I do for fun. Perfect. And and well, first of all, how how old is your son, and what what's his first name? My son is ten, and his name is Hajir. Azure. Okay. Wow. That's kind of a cool name. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about how did that expressive through expressing yourself through art or getting a release through art or different ways like that? How, where did that all begin? And yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So it started when I was uh, a really small girl I was probably about seven years old when I started drawing um, and I could draw portraits uh, like of, of people and it would look real. Mm. Uh, over the years of life happening, um, I kind of lost the gift. So when I started my healing journey, I started to um, do things that I did when I was a little girl and it was difficult. I wasn't drawing like I was when I was younger. Um, so it took a lot of practice and it just kind of helped me tap into my inner child as I began my uh, healing journey. Nice. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe Jay, yeah, just give us a little bit about, about your backstory. Like where, where are you from? Where, where did you grow up? Where'd you go to high school? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about Sarah, the younger Sarah. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, I moved around a lot when I was, when I was little, um, my grandmother lived in Woodstock, so we she was kind of like home base for us, her house. Um, but we lived uh, pretty much all over northern Illinois, Woodstock, McHenry, uh, Elgin, Rockford, um, pretty much all the suburbs in the north part of Illinois. Um, and that was until I was about... 12 years old. Uh, and then um, I was in foster care and I kept running away from the foster homes because I was scared to be there. And mm -hmm. then I ended up in juvenile hall and I never had a chance to go to high school. I got my GED when I was 16. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so obviously just a little bit of that, the moving around and then foster care, and then obviously juvenile, juvenile hall, juvenile attention, obviously that's a little bit of a story. So, so share with what you're comfortable with about, about, yeah, a little bit about those experiences that would kind of give us a, uh, because you, you've already kind of alluded to the, the healing process. So we know there's going to be a, 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 you know, some, a good part of the ending, but kind of fill us in on, um, what, what was the first part of the story? Um, the first part of the story as in when I was a young girl? Or... Yeah, or or you said they were moved around a lot. And what was, from what you know, what was the context of, of moving around? What what led to, you know, was it, was your, your parents, your mom moving around? What was, what was, re, what, from what you understood, what was the reason why the moving around happened so much? Um, so my understanding when I was a small girl is a lot different from my understanding now. When I was when I was younger, um, my interpretation was that my mom was just um, toxic, so to speak, just not healthy at the time. Yeah. Um, my understanding now is just that you know she's a human being. She was a single mom, and we all have struggles. We all have character defects or an ego, so to speak, that we need to, to work on. Right. Um, and it's just that period of time was just 
one big learning experience. <laughs> sure. Okay. Okay. And and obviously she, you know, there were there was obviously struggles that were happening for which led to you know needing to be able to to move or only having a place for a certain length of time. And and then then something obviously something happened at a point where you were then placed into foster care. And and yeah, tell us a little bit, you know. Obviously, there was reasons from what you maybe maybe you did know, maybe you didn't know why you were placed in foster care, but but that experience because not everyone knows what it's like for someone to experience being in foster care. And you said you were afraid, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and and yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I don't really know what it's like to be in foster care either because I kept running away from the foster home. <laughs> okay, but, um, the first foster home that I went to. Um, the, the the I stayed there for about five days, and on the fifth day, um, somewhere around within a week, it was like five to seven days. The um, foster mom had a pallet for me on the living room floor that I was sleeping on, and one night she came in there and she was caressing my hair, and she said that her and her husband had decided to keep me, and at that point I was like, no that's for me to decide if you're going to keep me or not, not you. And I snuck out the window that night. And then every time I got caught running away from the foster homes, I would just run away again. Um, as far as how I ended up there, um, I don't know the full details. I just know the detectives showed up at our house one day and they said that if we, if they didn't remove us from the home, uh, that my mom was going to kill us. So they wanted to get us out. Gotcha. Well, he kept my little brother, but my sister and I left. So, so your sister was older than you or younger than you? Correct. I'm I'm the middle child. Yeah. Okay. So you had an older sister, but then your youngest was actually stayed with your mom. Correct. Gotcha. And and so so th that was the circumstance, which is obviously not a lot of information to go with at 12 years old right and 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 then this idea that someone they think they're doing a good thing by saying we want you to stay here with us we're, we're going to keep you but but without knowing all these details mm -hmm. not knowing the circumstances that probably obviously would be pretty frightening um that actually happened. I was about 11. Um, by the time I was 12, I ended up in, in juvenile hall. Okay. Yeah. And, and so when you think back on that time period with of, of looking back on Sarah at that time period, what, um, what, what have you learned about that, that Sarah, that young person that was going through all these things and, and all these, ex, you know, all these external things are happening and you're, you're trying to survive and respond to it. What do you know now that maybe she didn't know at that time? Looking back in hindsight, I realized how I was being programmed for fight or flight. I just was constantly running, 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 always fighting, protecting myself from anything else bad happening to me. Okay. Yeah, I, I and you know it's in, it's 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 interesting. Of course, when we're in the midst of that, right? That that we're just surviving. So we don't know that that's what we're doing. And, and, and almost always it's the external, right. That we're, we're projecting or blaming for causing us to feel this way, which in some aspects is true. <laughs> right. But, but as we start going through our healing process and recovery, we recognize that every time that we're triggered may necessarily be something bad that's coming after us. And I also have, you know, looking back in hindsight, realized that every experience that I've ever, you know, went through, I was being protected by a higher power. There's situations that I was in where I look back at now and I just think, how am I not dead? Mm. It just is mind boggling how I'm still alive sometimes. So, so tell us, you know, I mean, when you think back to where you're at, you know, um, maybe from your spiritual development today versus be maybe earlier in your life, um, or, or where, where do you, where do you like the story regarding like the insight of like 
how that happens. I mean, I, I, I know what you mean. I mean, I, I think about some things of, of, I look back and I'm like, you know, someone would have thought when I, the way that I, the choices I made earlier in my life, someone might say, oh, that was pretty, you know, pretty courageous or pretty brave. I'm like, ah, that would mean that I knew what was happening. I just was reckless at times because I didn't know what was on the other side of the door, you know? And, um, but there was a, there was a time period where there was definitely an awareness that was different than, than, you know, than earlier in my life when I just was responding or reacting to things. And then all of a sudden I, I, I could not all of a sudden, but I, I noticed that I could see more. And, and it sounds like there was a time at some point, there was a shift for you where you recognize that um, instead of the world being a threatening place, there was gratefulness of how you were even in those dark times or threatening times, there was something, something greater happening to keep you safe. Absolutely. Definitely. I think that, you know, that, um, that moment that I'm, I, I can tell you about, um, it just puts everything into perspective and it makes you realize that every bad experience really isn't a bad experience. It's just an experience. Yeah. I, yeah. And it, and it's our perspective at that time, right? When we, when, when we're going through it or reflecting on it, we are, are are we are we looking at the obstacle as the setback or are we looking at the obstacle as an opportunity for 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 growth so um i know that uh how how again how i first saw that you had a you were doing a book signing and 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 you had put together a foundation so maybe tell us a little bit about uh about those things about the foundation and and what you're what you're doing now and what the foundation's about and and a little bit about the book that you've written Sure. So the foundation is a general nonprofit. We just work with people that um, are looking to overcome trauma or have had recent spirit. We, I, we, I like to work a lot with pe people that are going through spiritual awakenings or um, an AODA or um, just trying to heal their trauma. Um, but it is a general charity. So however we can help the community, we're always front and center. Um, right now we're actually working on a um, a writer's group so we can help other people write about their own stories and their own trauma yeah. um that's kind of up and coming and still in the process though okay uh, but it's been we've we've i've had the nonprofit for about three years now so still a work in progress gotcha it's a it's a whole nother world isn't it where the i know for me it was a it was a it was a whole nother world that i wasn't familiar with i had always worked in either school districts or for-profit uh uh, companies and it it was uh, I mean very good but it definitely is a there's different uh, hoops to jump through I guess that's a, that was something that I learned from it helping people is definitely my passion if if I could quit my my day job and do that full time I definitely would <laughs> sure sure what do you what's your day job right now uh, I own a mobile phlebotomy company oh gotcha okay all right so and and so that that's the as you said that's the day job to really serve it give you the means to do what you're most passionate about, which is, which is helping people. Yes. And 90% of the funds come out of my own pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I think about when I first started Shatter Our Silence, um, the nonprofit I started a few years ago was that the um, 90, probably 98% of, of the, of the, the work uh, came from, uh, came from my effort and, uh, and, and the amount of reimbursement I got was, uh, uh, was, was zero. <laughs> so, so I, I know, I know what you, I know what you mean. I remember one time, uh, because Shatter Our Silence is about suicide prevention and education and raising awareness. I, I got called by a local school district because one of their students had died by suicide. And um, so I met, I met with, we did a debrief um, immediately following with the principal and some of the administration and the and um, some some close individuals that were involved and in how to help the staff that was on a Sunday and how to help the staff the next day and so, of course I agreed to go and did all that and then the next day they wanted me to come in early in the morning and and of course I agreed to do that 
and I remember Monday morning waking up and and getting ready and I was in the shower and it was one of those, you know, prayer thinking, you know, process of, uh, of like, why are you doing this, Kevin? Like, why, why are you, why are you going, why, why are you doing this? And, and part of it was like, why are you doing this? Like, who do you think you are to do this? That part of it, like, nervous about going and trying to help you know people that with dealing with unbelievable news um and the other part was no really why are you doing this and it was the question where i didn't really have the answer and then what entered my mind was um so so kevin you don't really work with the poor and you don't really work with widows and you don't work in the jails anymore and i'm like really i'm not going to get paid for this this is like a ministry <laughs> and and so i felt like my answer was that god was telling me this is this is what i need you to do right now uh is to to be involved with when 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 institutions are in crisis when people are struggling with this that you need to insert yourself because of some of the experiences you have and some of the education you have and um and we'll 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 figure out how you're going to get paid for it but um later but uh that was a i mean i asked why so i found out what my why was and then you know well then once you know then you got to live it but that's that's a that's a different issue right <laughs> yeah yeah that's where i'm at now kind of just letting go and trusting the process yeah. uh you know because having being a mom and having three kids and you know a single mom and having bills to pay it's tough to just completely let go <laughs> yeah yeah and and i think you know i i think for at least from my experience it's really about being willing to walk that path mm -hmm. and 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 if the willingness to walk it and being being mindful like for me the rule of thumb has always been or I've come to realize the rule of thumb is if, if something comes up and asks me to do it, ask me to do something. And my first response is, Oh yeah, I definitely want to do it. I should probably guard myself because it's probably about Kevin wanting to do it. But if my first response is, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I can pull this off. I don't know if I'm going to be able to either financially or whatever, do it. I need to pay closer attention because maybe it's God prompting me to do it because I can't always trust my own thoughts um, and motivations because it might be Kevin driven. Um, and so for me, my, I, I try to pay attention to that first, what's my first reaction to it. And um, that's something I, I talk to people about a lot. I, I call it an intuition. Yeah. Um, and I say, you know, our first thought is usually our intuition, at least for me, my first thought is usually my intuition, but especially for people that have complex post-traumatic stress disorder, um, it, it gets tricky because after our first thought, our mind starts playing tricks on us and we start having all these other thoughts Then we start questioning ourselves and our own thinking and patterns and, and then it gets chaotic. And then we forget what our first thought was. Yep. Yep. No, I think you're hundred percent on sir. because if I, if I really break down what I just said is that almost every time that suggestion or prompting or, or invitation comes, I'm intrigued by it, but then the narrative starts kicking in about the, what the risk is or how it might not work or imposter syndrome kicks in or whatever it may be. And, and that's where I need to follow it a little bit further because it's probably something greater than myself, you know, one, you know, trying to stretch me and, and develop me. But if I'm all in like a hundred percent, oh, I got this. I'm probably got some blind spots that I got to be careful of. So, but, um, so, uh, so I, I know that you had, um, you had, you had put some of your, uh, some of your story into into a book form and and so so tell us tell us a little bit about the the name of your book and 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 what was what was the whole message you wanted to uh, have from the book sure so the title of the book is mama called me crazy 
And the subtitle is um, Unlearning Everything and Overcoming Illusions. Okay. Uh, I named it Mama Called Me Crazy because my mom and I have a very rocky kind of relationship. It's always kind of been, she's calling me crazy, I'm this, I'm that. And then she is constantly abandoning us, you know, since, since we were little, my sister and I anyways. Um, so that was kind of the gist of it. But then, you know, the subtitle, unlearning everything and overcoming illusions. I can't, I can't judge my mom. You know, I, I, if I judge her, I will be judged. So, and, and it's a memoir all about my journey from, you know, where I began and how I overcame all my trauma and, and who I am today and what I've learned from all of my experiences. Um, and the purpose of the book is um, the purpose of your podcast to inspire other people to overcome their own trauma. Gotcha. Perfect. And and so what, when you think back, when, when did, how long, when in your journey, how long ago did you have the idea that you wanted to take your story and put it into a memoir, put it into a book? And, and how, tell us a little bit about what that experience in itself was. Sure. So, um, when I was in juvenile hall, I read somebody's memoir um, when I was about 12 or 13, um, a, a gentleman that was this big gang banger and, and he wrote his story about overcoming some of the things that he had been through. So that was the first time that I had ever thought about it, but it just kind of came and went because I was still young and think about it again. Um, when I got released from juvenile hall, I was sent to a group home until I was 16 and I was emancipated. And my counselor there was one of the most influential people that I have crossed paths with. Um, and he suggested when I was barely 16, like, you need to write a book now. And I'm like, I'm only 16. I can't write a book yet. No, <laughs> just wasn't an option. So again, it just came and went. And then um, as I got older, uh, yeah, it, it was always there in the back of my mind, um, but I just felt like I would be a hypocrite to write anything as to be influential to other people if I haven't achieved anything big, like big enough to really talk about, you know, like, yeah, I went through trauma, but now what? We've all been through trauma. We've all had experiences that we could talk about, right? But overcoming them and being a, 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 you know, a product of overcoming those and, you know, not being a product of the trauma. So um, once I felt like I got to that point where somebody could actually benefit from hearing my story, I, I sat down and I wrote that book in two weeks. Really? Yes. I, I just got it all down on paper. And then it took me about two months with an editor to kind of spruce it up and get it all ready, you know, to, to put out there. But I knew if I didn't write that book in two weeks, I would have probably chickened out again. <laughs> sure, sure. You know, there's a couple of things that you just said, Sarah, that I think are important, important for important for me, as well as important, maybe for other people to hear, right? Is that this, this, this myth that my story isn't valid till I... Yeah you know, I don't know, have a degree or I have a title or I, whatever, right? Whatever that thing is that somehow now I'm legitimate to share my story. Right. And, and I, and I think, and correct me if, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the credibility to share your story comes with facing it, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and then learning about yourself that you wouldn't have learned if it wouldn't have happened. That's the true achievement. Until you really overcome your, yourself, like that's the biggest achievement. I, I didn't know myself. I had no idea who I was for the first 31 years of my life. And I'm not 40 yet. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I mean, when, I, I feel like once I really got to know myself and I knew who I was, then I could really share my story. Um, but again, writing really is therapeutic for everyone. Even if you don't have anything that you feel proud of, just writing it down, you'll realize things, there's so many things there is to be proud of. 
being resilient and, 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 and bouncing back from these tough situations and realizing how everything was just teaching you something. You, you see the greatness in yourself just by writing. Well, I think the exercise, I mean, that's why every counselor, you know, the, our number one thing we have to do is we have to tell you to journal, right? In, in, <laughs> and But as counselors, sometimes what we don't do is explain why it's beneficial to journal, right? And and that why it is what you just said. It, it is, it is, sometimes it is beginning the process of mapping mm -hmm. your journey from that point on. Sometimes it's a way of, of having a, a, a place to put your thoughts so it doesn't have to ramble around in your th head. But to what you just said, I think is critical is that if I can realize that when I write on October 4th of 2023 or whatever the date is, I write what my story is. And then I realize that that is just my perception at this moment of what's happened. And then I look at what's influencing that. That means I have the ability to influence that story, right? And, and you know, you said something earlier that I think is, is key is that maybe there was a time period in your life where out of anger, out of, out of hurt, out of, of pain, that you could have resentment and judgment towards somebody. And then later recognize, ooh, maybe, maybe what I'm most disliking there is what I don't like about myself. And I don't want to be judged that way. So I need to stop only seeing that person this way. And, and maybe there's more to the story that I just don't know about. And I think writing our story out, journaling, uh, you know, I, I think all those things can happen, you know, can help in that process of, of, you know, recognizing, you know, like when I talk about, when I do some teachings about Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey and recognizing that the individuals in my life play a part that's activating things in my life that I need to learn about Kevin not necessarily you know they're just characters in the story so yeah. stop taking it so personal <laughs> i firmly believe that everybody we cross paths with is a mirror of something we need to learn or some a reflection yeah i was just recently talking to somebody about how how if how if if, if one person says something to them there is like no activation at all no 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 response at all and if a family member said the same thing to them or someone close to them said the same thing then they get activated and i'm like what's why is there difference mm -hmm. and 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 then they went on to explain and then i reflected back to them what they said and i said that's on you mm -hmm. you, you having that expectation that they were supposed to know and you gave grace to the person that you didn't know, mm -hmm. maybe, <laughs> may, maybe that's the, the, you know, the beginning of where, where they can take back some of their power. Yeah. Perception is everything. So, so Sarah, with, with um, your foundation and, and with, with your, this, your story through your, through your memoir, What's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Um, if they wanted to reach out, they wanted to either contribute or know more about, or 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 maybe uh, purchase your book. What what's the best way for them to reach you? Um, I can be contacted via email. We do have a website, um, and the book is available on Amazon as well. Okay. And what what what's first? What's the website, and then what's that? What's the email that you would want them to contact you? Sure. So the um, email um, the email is info at graysfoundation.org and that's grays g-r-e-y-s perfect and the website is graysfoundation.org perfect okay <laughs> and so so sarah if if there is something that you would want to leave someone listening and and obviously you know the listeners can be at any any place in their life right 
if there was something that you would want to leave somebody with today, um, what would you want them? What message would you want to leave them as, as we're getting ready to sign off? Uh, well, I think the most important message that I would want people to understand is that um, I believe we all share one purpose in life, and that is to overcome ourselves. I don't think that we, you know, we need to overcome anybody else and point fingers or blame anybody for anything. Um, every, like I said, every experience is meant to teach us something about ourselves. So when we can overcome ourselves, we can overcome anything and, and, and our world around us will change. Well, sir, I think I think you just said there's a lot of wisdom in what you just said and recognizing you know, ourselves and what we attach meaning to, you know, or that energy that that comes up when we, you know, get mad or get resentful or get sad or whatever. Um, if we can recognize that, that piece, that attachment, that, that part of the story, and be able to can start understanding that and recognize that we, we are the one that fuels that, not some external thing. Um, regardless of the circumstances. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I think that is some of the stories of other individuals, you know, that have survived and then told the story of some horrendous trauma. Um, it almost always comes back to the same thing, is that I may not have been able to control my circumstances and the circumstances were, were, were wrong to have happened, but I did have control of what I thought and what I did with them. Yes, yes. I have to remind myself consistently to turn the attention inwards. You know, and 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 I also believe the work is never over. No matter how much inner work we do, it's never over. We it's constant. As long as we're alive, we're gonna have to keep working on ourselves. I I that reminds me of of there's that phrase that is associated with Native Americans that that you'll never step into the same stream twice. And, and I think from what you just said, like a stream, like a river, uh, life is never the same. So what you know about yourself yesterday, uh, today, <laughs> there's new elements, there's new people, there's new experiences, and, and now you've added on to uh, the Kevin... Uh, of yesterday, the Sarah of yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, I, I think I believe in reincarnation. I'm not sure if you do, but I, I definitely believe in past lives and I believe in reincarnation. So I, I think that, you know, whatever we're struggling with, whatever experiences we're having in, in our lives are lessons that we came here to learn. Mm -hmm. Like we chose to come here to live the life that we're living to experience everything that we've experienced so that we can learn what we needed to learn. No, I definitely think there's some, there's definitely elements to that. And, and I like for me, it's better for me to take that stance of that. I'm here to learn the lessons that, it, that are occur in my life versus I'm a victim to the things that have occurred in my life. I, I don't do well when I go victim. Um, no. But I'm a, I'm a really practiced powder though. I can I can pout with the best of them, but um and and throw tantrums. But um but it, I don't like when I go there. So I I agree with you. I need to avoid the victim um, process regardless of what my circumstances are. Yeah, I agree. So, well, Sarah, thank you for being with us. And 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 again, uh, it it's the email is info at uh, Grace Foundation. That's with an e Foundation dot com, right? Dot org. Dot org. And then uh, grazefoundation.org is the website. Correct. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, for anyone that's been listening today, um, definitely reach out to uh, to Sarah if you want to know more about her story through her memoir. And if you want to contribute to the foundation to try to continue passing this message along that, that we all have a story and we all have the responsibility to, to address um, the obstacles in our life and to continue developing our stories to be the people that we, um, we want to be. As always, thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to being with you next week.